When it went into service in 1955, the B-52 was the pinnacle of jet bomber design. But its genesis can be traced to a decision made by the Department of Defense 10 years earlier when the nation was at war. Throughout much of World War II, America was committed to the development of proven technology because this would enable production lines to churn out the tools of war with the urgency needed. Piston engines were greatly improved. The piston power plant drove every American aircraft that served in the fierce air battles of World War II. Even the massive Boeing B-29, which had more speed, range, and payload than any other bomber, still depended upon piston engine technology. The B-29 was thought to be the ultimate in aviation, but in fact, its high technological standard was soon rendered obsolete by a new breed of aircraft. Early in the war, it came as a major shock for the United States to learn that Germany and Britain had developed gas turbine jet engines that would soon be able to propel fighters at speeds far faster than the fabled Superfortress. In 1944, the American Army Air Force issued a requirement for an all-jet bomber fast enough to elude jet fighters. Contracts were issued for no less than five different designs. But it took another technological marvel, nuclear fission, to bring the war to a quick and dramatic end. Although a B-29 was employed to carry the weapon, just one aircraft dropped one bomb, and in seconds, the city of Hiroshima ceased to exist. If one aircraft could carry such a devastating payload, then perhaps large fleets of bombers would no longer be needed to win a modern war. The dreadful cost in lives that America had paid to establish island B-29 bases in the Pacific had changed the parameters for the next generation of bombers. During the early post-war period, Strategy concentrated on the ability to deliver the atomic bomb over very long distances. And the Air Force put its emphasis on long-range intercontinental aircraft, a role that the Convair B-36 Peacemaker adequately filled for some time. The giant B-36 was really a Second World War design that arrived too late for combat. It required no less than six massive piston engines to propel it at what were average speeds. However, jet engines were later fitted in pods under the wing to supplement its power. By 1947, the jet bomber project was starting to come to fruition. In that year, five submissions were tested, although by now they were classed as medium bombers. 
The B-45 was the first of the jets from the 1944 requirement, and it was the second most successful. This simple but effective four-engine design was actually adopted by the Air Force and went into service in limited numbers, though mainly in the reconnaissance role. Consolidated offered the B-46 as another four-engine jet bomber. Its clean lines made it one of the most elegant aircraft of the time, and its performance as an early jet was quite acceptable. However, Consolidated was heavily committed to B-36 production, and the medium bomber project was not given a high priority. The B-48, designed by Martin, was a cumbersome aircraft that employed six jet engines in mid-wing clusters. About the most impressive technology it offered was its bicycle undercarriage, placed on the center line of the aircraft and supported by two outrigger wheels on each wing. This project did not tempt the Air Force, and like the B-46, the prototype was scrapped. Northrop, in an attempt to compete in the jet bomber program, took its previously piston engine flying wing and equipped it with eight turbojets. The wing was a brilliant design that offered excellent efficiency. It was years ahead of its time. Perhaps because it was so different, it never seemed to attract government approval. The technological grasp that Northrop had of flying wings paid off 40 years later in the form of the B-2 stealth bomber. Today, the B-2's wing is a symbol of cutting-edge aviation design. But in 1947, the idea was considered far too revolutionary. Without doubt, the most impressive design offered to the Air Force came from Boeing. Their B-47 Stratojet design benefited from the manufacturer's analysis of German data on swept wing technology. To obtain the maximum efficiency these wings could provide, they were made extremely thin and flexible. Therefore, their six engines had to be suspended on pylons and spread across each wing. This approach made servicing the engines easier and also had aerodynamic benefits for the aircraft at speed. Because the wing was so thin, Boeing used the same fuselage-mounted bicycle undercarriage as Martin's B-48. The B-47 was adopted by the Air Force, and literally hundreds were produced during the early 50s. It was, by any standard, a very successful design, a classic case of having the right design at the right time but it was also an ideal test bed for Boeing to gain experience on the production of efficient swept wing jet bombers. I'm Jim Larkins, Lieutenant Colonel of the United States Air Force retired. Wings will be right back. Now we return to Wings on the Discovery Channel. 
One of the problems of early jet engines was the relatively long time they took to reach full power, especially at takeoff. To offset this, Boeing adopted several versions of detachable rocket boosters, what became known as Jet Assisted Takeoff, or JATA. Following Boeing's legendary piston engine bombers, the success of the Stratojet project was to hold Boeing in good stead with the Air Force for years to come. The medium bomber project gave Boeing an edge in the new struggle to develop a new long-range heavy bomber to replace the B-36 Peacemaker, a plane that was clearly at the end of its career. In an attempt to keep the Peacemaker project alive, Convair produced an all-jet swept wing version given the model number XB-60. However, the revamping of an aircraft originally designed in the Second World War did not impress the Air Force. As far back as 1946, Boeing had been commissioned to develop a replacement for the Peacemaker. The company explored hundreds of different concepts, ranging from ultra-large piston engine aircraft to those using proposed compound supercharged power plants and others with turboprops, jet engines driving propellers. But nothing provided the dramatic increase in performance over the B-36 that the Air Force was looking for. When the efficiency of the B-47's full swept wing became apparent, Boeing proposed another all-jet design, based loosely on its medium bomber, but larger, much larger. This idea was refined on model 464-67 and was ultimately accepted by the Air Force as the B-52. An order for two prototypes, the X and Y models, was placed in October 1948. But due to minor problems with the X model, the YB-52 was ready first. Here, the YB-52 undergoes tests at Edwards Air Force Base. Its overall shape and fighter-like canopy was similar to the B-47, but its size and performance was much greater. The B-52 also had many updated features, like an all-steerable undercarriage that adjusted to face forward on landing, even when the aircraft was pulling to one side. This feature was top secret for several years. Apart from the cockpit layout, which was changed to a conventional side-by-side -side airliner arrangement, there was very little external difference between the prototypes and the B-52s that went into production. Work began in earnest on the B-52A, now named the Stratofortress. Only three B-52A models were built, but the B model, which was identical to the 52A except for minor improvements, went into full production. Increased range was always a primary goal for the bomb. In-flight refueling, which had been perfected in the late 1940s by Boeing's flying boom method, had solved many problems. However, in the early days of the B-52 project, in-flight refueling was tricky at best. The early aerial tankers were powered by piston engines with a maximum speed little more than the stalling speed of the jet bombers. Here, the Y model negotiates the delicate task. Jet tanker refueling was obviously preferable and safer. It was only with the arrival of the KC-135 Stratotanker that aerial refueling became relatively safe and practical.
One other method of increasing range was the adoption of extra-large outboard wing tanks, like this example, which can hold 3,000 gallons and can be jettisoned in a combat situation. By March 1954, B-52s were rolling off Boeing's production line in Seattle. The planes then went into an induction program where air crew and aircraft were blended into one fighting machine. Inside this sleek shape, crews of six men learned the ways of the Stratofortress. After the B-36, they found Boeing's bomber much more cramped. Every available inch had been dedicated to fuel, payload, and electronics. Where the Peacemaker had no less than six gun positions, the B-52 had only one. The plane relied on its performance and the new science of radar jamming for its self-defense. The Strategic Air Command had to have the world's best bomber. B-52 is a great plane because I liked flying it. It was a fun plane to fly. One of the most challenging things about it was refueling it. You get a plane that big, you know, 500,000 pounds behind a, a tanker that's 350,000 pounds, and you got to transfer 120,000 pounds of fuel. That's uh, that's uh, part of the things that, that make it a great plane. It, it can go and go and go. I never got to fly it, but they used to fly 24-hour uh, missions in B-52s, just refuel. So I think what makes a great plane a great plane where all the crews that flew it over so many years, you know. My father was too old to fly, and I'm one of the younger people flying it myself, but uh, there are probably 25 years old that are flying it that are planes 10 years older now. Now, back to Wings on the Discovery Channel. The Strategic Air Command made the same heavy demands of its crews that it did of its new B-52 bombers. Crew members were trained until they became an elite corps of professionals, forming a team equal to the sophisticated new aircraft they flew. For over 10 years, the Stratofortress and its crew had one primary responsibility, carrying and delivering the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb. But if the bomb was to be carried as a deterrent, it had to be tested to prove its potential. Throughout the 1950s, hydrogen bombs were detonated in remote Pacific regions. The last tests, like many before, used B-52s to drop the deadly payloads. destructive device ever conceived by the human mind is a matter of precision and routine. A specialist hauling job for the highly trained members of the Strategic Air Command team. Each cargo has a 100 megaton yield, 100 times greater than the bombs dropped on Japan. Like the weapons of the Second World War, the device carried in this bomb bay will be slowed in its drop from the B-52 by a parachute, allowing the bomber more time to vacate the area before the cataclysmic explosion.
Fearing a Soviet atomic attack, America set up an elaborate array of early detection facilities during the Cold War years. The early warning systems were based mainly in the frozen north, the most likely route of a first strike. Radar watchers constantly monitored scanners that probed the sky, looking for the blip that might signal the beginning of World War III. The Strategic Air Command had fleets of B-52s on operational standby, in a constant state of alert, ready to act as the ultimate deterrent if needed. When the red phone rang, the procedure was automatic. Up to 100 strato fortresses could be dispatched in a few short minutes. The routine was finely tuned by regular exercise. The concept of an instant retaliatory strike by SAC was seen as the nation's best defense during the Cold War years. The business of nuclear deterrence was trusted only to carefully screened officers. All nuclear armed B-52 pilots held at least the rank of major they bore the heavy responsibility of commanding aircraft that could change, or even end, life on Earth. Just as jets replaced piston engines, so the B-52 and its high-flying Soviet counterparts were superseded by an efficient and very deadly new technology that was born in Nazi Germany. By the early 1960s, ground-to-air missiles had been perfected by the U.S. and the Soviets to the point where massive nuclear bombardment by aircraft would be difficult to achieve. The emphasis had shifted to another form of delivery, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Years of development had produced the Polaris and Minuteman missiles, among other forms of rocketry, which meant that manned flights over enemy airspace were no longer necessary to wage full-scale nuclear war. But SAC Strato fortresses were kept in service. They still had a major role to play in the dangerous game of nuclear brinkmanship. For the trouble with ICBMs was that once launched, they could not be called back. This denied politicians the time-honored tactic of saber-rattling and further heightened the risk of international conflict. The B-52, used in conjunction with Hound Dog standoff bombs, provided a flexible alternative. B-52s could proceed to the very edge of enemy airspace, signaling America's readiness to attack, but still providing time for last-minute negotiations. The B-52's effectiveness was further increased by the development of the Quail decoy, which confused enemy radar by mimicking a stratofortress radio signal. Further development after the Hound Dog produced the SRAM missile. Small and able to be carried in greater numbers, the SRAM could be guided from within the B-52 to targets up to 100 miles away with devastating accuracy.
In 1965, the B-52 was used for the first time in Vietnam. Now it carried conventional bombs instead of nuclear warheads, but it remained a deadly weapon. The wing mounts now carry 24 500-pound iron bombs. The internal bomb load brought the total payload of each plane up to a total bomb load of 108. course of the Stratofortress's involvement in Southeast Asia, B-52s dropped in excess of three million tons of bombs. Although the use of the high-flying bombers was controversial at the time, there is little doubt that the Stratofortress was very effective when used for conventional bombing. Many historians argue that the heavy bombing of North Vietnam during the linebacker operations pushed the enemy back to the negotiating table and eventually resulted in ceasefire. During other Vietnam operations, more sophisticated bombs were dropped. Some could be detonated later by personnel in other aircraft using infrared viewing equipment to coincide an explosion with enemy activity. Standard 500 and 750 pound iron bombs like these were used on most B-52 raids. facilitate quick loading and turnaround, the internal bomb load was contained in pre-arranged racks so they could be installed in the shortest possible time. initially based at Guam prepare for the long eight-hour flight to their distant target. The crew in the front office and the lonely rear gunner assume their positions as each aircraft prepares for takeoff. The primary role with B-52 in, in the Vietnam was basically tactical bombing of enemy troop concentrations. But it really started out, uh, we used to cut roads early in 67. We did a lot of missions, we were interdicting uh, trucks and supplies, uh, but primarily we were cutting roads to back them up so the tactical forces could uh, make the strikes. Uh, later in, around Quezon, we were really breaking up enemy uh, troop uh, formations. Uh, and we got very, very successful as they had to concentrate their forces. We became more successful at uh, what the role of the B-52 could really bring to bear, which is massive air power. Our defense posture provides the umbrella under which all competition flourishes in this capitalistic society. So the B-52, because of its tremendous design, lasted a great long time. And because of the philosophy and sometimes the tendency to forget history, 
which we seem to do in this country, it's lasted a long time as well. It's had to. During the long years of the Vietnam War, nose art was drawn on more than a few B-52s. Although the art was tamer than its Second World War counterpart, the missions flown were no less hazardous. B-52 crews had to cope with fast and agile enemy MiGs, anti-aircraft guns, and worst of all, deadly surface-to-air missiles. Despite it all, they had missions to perform, and like all soldiers, they flew regardless of opposition. After a raid, ground crews hurriedly repaired the bullet-riddled airframes of return stratofortresses, priming them for the next mission. Sometimes the hits were uncomfortably close. Despite the low fuel takeoff policy, the heavy weight of the bomb load put tremendous stress on the engines, which regularly needed maintenance and often replacement. MiGs were kept at bay and sometimes shot down by rear gunners, who in their lonely outposts employed a radar-aimed remote-controlled array of four cannons with devastating firepower. The tail gunner's position was deleted with the arrival of the B-52G and H models. All B-52 G and H models are equipped with EVS, Electronic Visual Systems. This enables the pilot and other crew members to see what is ahead of the aircraft, even in darkness and fog, via infrared television cameras and a monitor. This development came just in time, as the role of the B-52 has changed to that of a low-level tactical bomber. Today's stratofortresses may have to fly blind through atomic clouds, with the B-52 shielded by radiation-proof curtains, the EVS is the crew's only visual link to the outside world. But though the mission has changed, Red phones and flashing lights are still the currency of SAC. When the bell rings in exercise or in war, SAC's awesome deterrent force swings into action. The first thing a general in charge of operations will do is vacate his ground base for the safety and mobility of an aerial command post. At the same time the alert is given, air crews rush to their aircraft, which are always on standby for instant action.
general is airborne, and the B-52s are close behind. It is only in the safety of the air that Sachs deterrent force can survive an attack and at the same time be on their way to deliver a response. The high-speed takeoff is a prerequisite to survival. In this exercise, the prospect of a nuclear flash is provided for, and the radiation resistance curtains are put into place. Now the crew is totally dependent on the EDS and other electronic aids, for they dare not look out of the cockpit. Flying low over the ground, each pilot awaits his orders. This time, the B-52s are called back, but all concerned know that they have the capability to go into enemy territory if required. exercise is over and the general is content. After almost 40 years of service, the B-52 still performs its mission well, though the plane is clearly nearing the end of its service life. We went over there arc light, which was six months at a time, and I did it. I did it five or six times. I don't remember. But the thing was, is you live with these people. You live with them. You sleep with them. You eat with them. They become brothers. So you trust them with your lives. You literally did because if an Ewo said break right or break left, you didn't ask why. You just did it. That means turn a plane left or right because there was a threat coming. You just did it. You knew that whatever he was telling you, he was in the plane with you and vice versa. You never second-guessed the other guy because they were the expert in their position. And that's what the teamwork was. You learned to respect the other guy's position and how well they served in their position. The B-52 is getting old. It does need a follow-on bomber. And uh, I think the B-1 is probably that type of an aircraft. Next question evolves is, do we need the B-2s? I don't know. It's awful expensive aircraft. Almost as soon as the first B-52 rolled off the assembly line, the Strategic Air Command was searching for a replacement. First came the ill-fated XB-70, an advanced design that was considered outmoded by ground-to-air missile technology. More recently, there was the swing-wing B-1 bomber developed by Rockwell International. The B-1 provided a combination of high speed and altitude with the wings swept back, and more economical low-level flying with the wings forward. However, the cost of deploying large numbers of B-1s was not acceptable to the Carter administration, 
and the project was shelved throughout the 70s. In the 1980s, the revamped B-1B went into production, not in the high-altitude role, but as a low-level bomber. Approximately 100 B-1Bs have been deployed by the Strategic Air Command. The plane is costly, but if the B-1B equals the overall performance and value for money that its predecessor, the B-52, so clearly achieved, it's money well spent. After three decades of service, through a period of unprecedented technological advances, the B-52 is still a weapon of awesome power and effectiveness. It will be a very hard act to follow. <laughs> 